So another year has come and gone, and a lot of us are in the same fucking place we were last year. What the fuck are you waiting on? We sleep one third of our fucking lives, and we think we can take fucking days off. We think we have the right to sit back and give ourselves fucking options on which way we're gonna go in life. Am I gonna run today? Am I gonna work out today? Well, it's Christmas. It's New Year's. It's my birthday. Do you think time gives a fuck that it's Christmas, that it's New Year's, that it's your birthday? You're giving yourself too many fucking options. Let me tell you one thing. Time is running out. You keep on sitting around wondering what the fuck you want to do. You're just going to run out of time. So make sure you do one thing. Stop following the fucking crowd. They may take time off, but you can't afford to. Stay hard. A lot of people put a title on me. They want to, uh, they see me now. They see me now as the guy that with his shirt off who can do 4,000, 30 pull-ups in 17 hours, who can run 205 miles in 39 hours, who can do all this crazy shit. But what they don't understand is they don't understand the journey that it took me to get to this point. And what got me to this point was I was just the opposite of what I am today. I was that guy who ran away from absolutely everything that I got in front of me. But not many people knew that. I had two people. I had the, I had the, like, like the real me was like this very scared, insecure, stuttering, got beat up by his dad, all this kind of stuff. And then I, I built this fake person that walked around like my shit didn't stink. So that was, that's kind of how I did it. And I, through the process of time, I realized that I was lying to myself and lying to people. My dad beat the shit on me when I was growing up. We, I was the first black baby born in this hospital called Miller Fillmore in Buffalo, New York. My dad owned skating rinks, he owned bars, he ran prostitutes from Canada to Buffalo, New York. My dad was a big time pimp, big time. Anything bad about a person, big time hustler. He was American, you know that, that movie with um, Daniel Washington? Mm -hmm. He was that, but not that bad. Right. You know, he wasn't that big. But that's what it reminds me of, he was that kind of guy and um, beat the shit out of me, the shit out, you know, out of my mom. There was an incident one time when my mom got knocked out on top of the stairs and he drug her down the stairs by her hair. And at six years old, um, I'll never forget this. In my mind, I, I was always afraid. My whole life I was afraid, but I had this fucking voice, this, this conscience that would always be battling me saying, hey, you gotta get up and do something. I didn't want to do shit. You know, I, I was just afraid, but I would, that, that voice would force me to get up and my dad, you know, I try to beat him up, whatever, at six, and I get my ass kicked. So this went on for several years. And I have a big time learning disability. Cause my dad didn't believe in us going to school. So my dad, it was about the business, the skating rink and the bar. So the skating rink opened about seven o'clock at night. And this is the time I was able to walk. So about five, you know, four, five, six years old, eight, nine. And I'll go to the you know, skating rink at seven o'clock at night. And I worked the skating rink until 10 at night. And then we would scrape the gum off the floors and we cleaned the whole skating rink up. And then my dad had an office. And my brother and myself would sleep in the office. And my mom would go upstairs and work the bar until three o'clock in the morning. And then they cleaned the bar up. So after all that shit was done with, going to school rarely happened. So when I went to school, I was all kind of, you know, my, my learned disability. I had social anxiety. I was just a jacked up kid from living in this tortured home. From the outside looking in, we lived in an all-white neighborhood, and then we would travel to the ghetto of Buffalo, New York, where the skating rink was at. So we, you know, we worked around mostly blacks, and I lived around mostly whites, but no one knew what was going on in that house at, on 201 Paradise Road. You know, it, it's crazy. But um, my mom got courage to finally leave him. When I was about eight years old, we moved to a small town in Brazil, Indiana, and that's when the real war started for me. And Brazil, Indiana is a small town. Great people, a lot of great people. And I say that because a lot of people get offended. And, and I'm, I'm gonna get to the point where they get offended. There was about maybe 10 black families at about 10,000 people in the town. And in 1995, the KKK marched in the 4th of July parade. So this was a, not everybody was racist. There was a lot of good people. Some of the best people I knew was there, but there was also a lot of racism there. So me being one of the few black kids in that, you know, in that area, you know, it, it kind of haunts you. I had stuff on my notebook, you know, nigga, we're gonna kill you, on my Spanish notebook. They had that on my car, nigga, we're gonna kill you. This is early 90s. And um, so, even though 
I showed it didn't hurt me, it was jacking me up. So all the insecurities I had when I was a kid with my father, I moved into this area here and it just got worse and worse and worse. And the shit haunted me. And that voice that I talked about, it kept talking louder and louder and louder, but I was doing nothing about it. And I decided to make moves. And I cheated all through school. And it's, it's kind of humbling to talk about my stories sometimes. And it's, um, it's, it's also embarrassing, but um, it's real. It's who the fuck I am. It's, it's, it's what I am. It's, it's, it's what created me. And copy from the fourth grade to, the, to, to my junior year in high school on every assignment. And I wanted to get in the military, I wanted to join the Air Force, and the guy gave me an ASVAB test. It's like a watered down SAT. And I couldn't copy on it because the guy beside me had a test A, I had test B, the guy on my right had test C. So I looked to copy on this test and I couldn't copy on it, so I got like a 20. And I wanted to be an Air Force pararescueman. It's guys that jump out of airplanes and save down pilots. It's a, it's a special operator in the Air Force. And my score was so horribly low that I had to retake it again. And he said, hey, I got like an 18 the second time, even worse. I need to get a 50 out of a 99. And so my mom and I, for a while, we lived in the government subsidized apartments, $7 a month, and also food stamps. And we slowly moved up to a $230 a month place. But at the time, you know, we were you know, pretty poor. But um, my mom afforded enough money for me to go to see a tutor one, one hour a week. So for four hours a month, I had six months to study for my last test. I could only take the acid test, you know, the acid test three times. And I studied my ass off and passed it. And I got in the Air Force and realized there was more things in front of me. I was afraid of the water, terrified of the water. And um, I learned how to swim. But what gets everybody in this training, in all special ops training, is the water confidence, where they try to pretty much drown your ass. You know, all of our lives we've been breathing. And they take that from you, and they want to see how comfortable you are in the water. And there's only 1% African Americans in special operations. And I didn't know anything about African, like a lot of them are negative buoyant, which I am, because of the bone density, I, I struggled. But um, six weeks into the program, there's about 25 guys left out of about 150. I was there, and I was never, I didn't go to sleep for six weeks of the program. And I wanted to quit so badly, but I quit everything in my life. I copied through school. I wanted to prove people wrong. And so here I am in this Air Force program, starting to get a little more confidence, but this water was kicking my ass. And six weeks into the program, the doctor gave me a blood test. It was that sickle cell, sickle cell trait, not the anemia, but it still killed people. But so they pulled me out of training for a week. And when you go from being very uncomfortable in that water situation, and then now you're comfortable, and I'm sitting back watching the guys drown, I'm not, you know, I'm not part of the activities anymore for this week. I didn't want to get back in that damn water again. So the fear overcame me and all my insecurities from my dad, from this small town, from everything started coming back. And even though no one knew how fucked up I was, kind of create this other person who was tough, I live with this shit all the time. So me not wanting to go back in that water, the doctor called me back up. I thought I was going to get like a, like a medical kick out of the military. So no quitting for me. They'll kick me out so I can have some pride. The doctor said, no, man, we're kidding. You know, we can put you back in the training. And I was like, fuck. But after a week, I'm like, you know what? I missed one week. There's only three weeks left. There's a good chance, you know, I could tuck this shit out and go on. But I went back to the CO and the commanding officer of the program. And the sergeant said, hey, you got to start from day one because you missed, you know, that, that week of training. And I broke. I broke. I, I, I couldn't imagine going back through that again. So I made up a lie. And I said, man, the sickle cell thing is really scaring me. It was the fucking water. It wasn't sickle cell. And, and I pretty much quit. Even though they gave me a medical, it, I quit. So um, from the age of 19 to the age of 22, I went and did a job called TAC-P, where you control fast movers behind enemy lines. Cool job, but there's no water. I was afraid of the water, so I avoided it. And um, I gained 125 pounds in that time frame. I went from 175 to almost 300, to 297 was my heaviest. And I started finding things that was comfortable. And the more things I found comfortable, the more uncomfortable my mind was. Because that voice I was telling you about, it, it always was there. I was just trying to avoid that conscience. I, I wanted to be left alone from that conscience and it wouldn't leave me alone. So I got out of the Air Force and I started working for a job called Ecolab, where you spray for cockroaches at 24 and um, spraying at different steak and shakes, 
Red Lobster, whatever, from 11 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. And what changed, I came home and watched this Discovery Channel show, um, Class 224. I came home from Steak and Shake, I sprayed it down last, get a big old large 42 ounce shake, walk across the street and get a box of mini donuts from 7-Eleven, and I would drive home for 45 minutes. This big old fat guy who, yeah, I worked out, but I was fat. I didn't run, didn't PT, I just, I just hit the gym. So I'm um, driving home, turn the TV on, and what comes on, the Scary Channel show, and that's where everything changed for me. I uh, was taking a shower, I walked out, heard these guys, and I watched the show, and it made me reflect big time on the piece of shit that I am, and I'm exactly what people said I was gonna be. So, so what was on this show that really struck home? It was, um, I saw these guys going in the water, so I, I was terrified of it. I mean, I can't even express, have you ever had a big fear? And I know a lot of fighters have fears and stuff like that, but they get over them. But a lot of us have these fears that you just don't want to fucking face. And um, I have a lot of them, I had a lot of them. And that's what created the person who's in front of you today, and we'll get into that. But um, just a scared bitch is what I was. And, but I was watching these guys going through Hell Week, class 224, and these guys ringing the bell, quitting, dropping their helmet down, rolling out, a lot of guys just leaving. And it made me reflect on my fears, my insecurities. And I saw real men, what I thought were real men who were staying, who were overcoming adversity, who were overcoming all these different things that I had blamed so many fucking people in my life. My, my dad, the, the, my, my mom for not being there. When I was 14 years old, my, my mom was gonna get remarried to this great guy. He got murdered. And then I moved back to that small town in Brazil and, and I, I, everybody was blamed. My, my learning disability, my, my skin color, you know, me, me being everything. And so um, I sat there for a while and I was like, man, I gotta fucking, I, I, I got it. No one's gonna fucking come to help me. No one's gonna fucking come to help me. It's, it's fucking me against me, period. And um, so I had to man up. And I said, the first thing I gotta start doing is facing every fucking fear I have. No matter what the fuck it is, man. And, I, and these things would keep me up. And I, no one, people who are hearing this shit, they, they will never, really understand and grasp when you face these things and so many things how they keep you up and haunt you at night i think there's a lot of people out there that know what you're talking about i mean and um so that's what it did and i i, I had two options to either be that 300 pound guy who sprayed for cockroaches and made a thousand dollars a month and at 24 years old knowing when i'm 50 fucking years old i can reflect on this and think about what guy i never became or i can totally just sack it up and fail and fail and fail until I succeed and I started working out like somebody I was I became the most obsessed person on the planet earth and I was basically I had to invent a guy that didn't exist I had to invent a guy that can take any pain any suffering any kind of judgment be called nigger be called whatever the fuck in the world and be able to stand in the fucking room and say go fuck yourself I had, to build, I had to build this callous mind and I built it through suffering. I built it through downright fucking just crushing myself. If, if it was raining outside at 3 o'clock in the fucking morning, if it was snowing, the first instinct is don't go out there and do shit. My instinct was we gotta fucking go out there. Anything that was fucking horrible in my life that I would normally say no, that was inhumane to most people, I had to go do it. And I started callousing my mind at this point in my life. And I lost the weight. And I lost the weight and I went back to the recruiter. I got into that class and I went through three Navy still hell weeks in one year. Only guy to ever be in three hell weeks in one year to my knowledge. The first one I didn't make it through, the next two I did. And um, that I just didn't I, I didn't stop anymore from there. And I started realizing through this through this process that the fucking mind is what you create. And I started opening different doors that I didn't think were even there, that I didn't think even existed. And the more doors I opened up, the more I started realizing that my potential is damn near endless. And it, and it changed my whole mindset. So I went from David Goggins and I created Goggins.